so much activity going on, so many people mingling and meeting one another. That's a, that's a blessing. We're about to start it, so I want to say welcome to Woodside Community Church. So glad to have you this morning. I pray that you've had a blessed week reading the word, memorizing scripture, thanking God. Let's not forget that part about thanking God. You know, when you look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you see, you see this list of horrible characteristics in people. And one word you'll notice, after you see lovers of self, proud and boastful, violent, you see ungrateful. And you say, how did that get in there? All of these terrible things, to be ungrateful? Yes, that is a big deal in God's sight. So as we come together to worship God, we want to thank him and praise him for his goodness. As the psalmist said, you, you, you hem me in. You're behind me and you're before me and your hand is, is upon me. You lay your hand upon me. Do you think of God like that? From Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, do you think that uh, God has forgotten you or do you recognize that he hems you in behind, in front, and his hand is upon you and say, thank you, Lord. I didn't have to make it home today. Thank you, Lord. I didn't have to get up this morning, but you got me up. Don't be ungrateful. So let's praise him today. As the word comes forward, lean forward. Hear what is being taught. Look at the word. Take it in and say, this is what I need. Thank you for feeding me, feeding my soul. Thank you, Lord. Visitors, we're so glad to have you. We pray that you would join us, sing with us. If you don't know the Lord is your savior, that you would receive him as such, as the Lord of lords, as the King of kings, and follow him hard for the rest of your life. In the back of the uh, pews, there are visitor's cards. We would ask that you would fill one out that we may uh, reach out to you. And everybody, I'll ask you to ensure that your phone is on vibrate so as not to interrupt the service. Your call to worship this morning comes out of Psalm chapter 99, verses 1 to 5. That's page 500 in your pew Bibles. That's Psalm 99, verses 1 to 5. Page 500 in your pew Bibles. There the word of the Lord says, The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Please pray with me. As we come together this morning, to worship you, Lord. We recognize you reign in heaven. You sit enthroned upon the cherubim and cause the earth to quake at your word. I pray we would cast all earthly fear, worry, and doubt aside and reverence the majestic and all-powerful God of the universe. Lord, you alone have the power to destroy all the kings of the earth with just one word. Father, you alone have the power to crush spiritual wickedness in high places while sending ministering spirits to attend to your people. So why do we fear? Why does a uh, uh, worry come upon us and we swim in doubt? On the contrary, may all who have bowed down to the King of Kings rejoice confidently in the fact that our Redeemer lives and cares for those who put their trust in him. It is in your son's mighty name that we pray. Amen.
Let's all rise as we sing our first song today, Before the Throne of God.
reading comes out of Psalm chapter 69. Psalm chapter 69. Page 482, if you're using the Pew Bible. It's another long psalm, so I'll ask you to follow along as I read. Page 482 in your Pew Bibles. And the Holy Word of God says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore? O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, O oh Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O oh God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your burning anger overtake them. May there can't be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous but I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Let us go to our Father in prayer. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? My Lord and my God, you have commissioned us to share the good news that Jesus died to save sinners. But we fail to fulfill this blessed call for a variety of reasons. If it's fear, help us to look to you, Lord. You are our light. You are our salvation. You are the good shepherd and deliverer. Your son has begun a work in us and will complete it. So why does fear have such a hold on us? Why are we so afraid to speak boldly before you as people who have been given their marching orders to proclaim Christ? Perhaps, perhaps it's, it's, it's apathy, Lord. Maybe we just don't care or, or just are not interested in others being delivered from the lust of the flesh, the temptations of the world, and the deceptions of the wicked one. Those who have been born again have been granted a new nature. We don't have to give in to these temptations. But those who are slaves to their old nature are bound to fail. They're chained to sin. Save them, Lord. And we ask that you would use us to tell them the truth about their condition and point them to the only one who can set them free. Perhaps one of the reasons that we don't share the way to eternal life is because we're having too much fun in this temporary life, my Lord. Help us to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. One thing have I asked of you, Lord, that will I seek after, that we may dwell in your house all the days of our lives to gaze upon your beauty and to inquire in your temple. Father, we pray for our devotional groups that meet during the week. As we take time to step away from the cares and duties of this world in order to fellowship, pray, read, and discuss your word, may those be our cares and may those things be our duties as we live in this world. May we be refreshed and further equipped to handle the challenges of the job, the home, and all relationships. May we look to stir up love in each other and develop a stronger devotion to you each and every time we meet. Now, Father, as Pastor Matt speaks from this pulpit today, let the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, we worship you because you are our rock and our redeemer. It is in the mighty name of your blessed son that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our next song is Whatever My God Ordains is Right.
You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to sing with you all. Oh, it's good to have Artesia back on the keys. Oh, I love our worship. Children, you are dismissed at this time. The rest of you are encouraged to get out a Bible. John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23, page 907 in the Pew Bible. John 20, 21 through 23. This is part two of what we began to consider two weeks ago. John 20, 19 through 22 are obviously all one scene, but I was not capable of doing this one scene in one sermon. There's some really hard stuff here and some really helpful stuff that I want us to pay close attention to. Last time we talked about the presence of God, I argued that the whole storyline of the Bible from beginning to end was a story of the presence of God. The Bible begins with God present with his people. Only three chapters in, we get the sin which ends God's presence with his people. But then at the end of the Bible, we see once again God present with his people. Everything in between, that beginning and ending of presence, is all about who God is and what he has done to restore his holy and happy presence to his sinful and miserable people. This Bible is the story of God with us, of how God is with us, how he can be with us. And Jesus, Emmanuel, is both God with us and how God can be with us. And as we saw last time, God's presence in Christ, we saw Jesus came and stood among them, that is where we find peace. Twice he pronounces, peace be with you. And that's where we find gladness. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Peace and gladness, the two things that all of us are looking for, for all of the time in all that we do. That's what we want. Instead of conflict, we want peace. Instead of sadness, we want gladness. And we're trying to get it into our heads that we find those not in favorable, comfortable, prosperous, earthly circumstances. We find those in the reality of God with us, regardless of our circumstances, and the realization of God with us, regardless of our circumstances. Are we at peace? Are we glad? If not, why not? Well, one of the possible reasons is the next part of our text. I shared with you two headlines last time, Americans suffering at rate rarely reached, and New York City designates social media a public health hazard, and we talked about why. It's a public health hazard. Why? It's a poison that is bad for you. And it's in part because it's, even though it's called social, its design is actually selfish. It turns you in on yourself and drives your focus and your attention to yourself. And as we are seeing, such a focus on self only leads to conflict and sadness. And so today we consider a solution, a third result of the presence of Christ, peace gladness, and then, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are sometimes miserable because we miss the mission. And this mission, ultimately about the glory of God and the good of others, paradoxically and beautifully, redounds and returns and results also in good and gladness and peace for us. But if you are anything like me, you so often miss this basic pattern because you are still so prone to be so caught up with and concerned with yourself. This morning, we are going to see how the presence of Christ turns us outward, how it shifts our focus upward and outward as we are sent, tasked with a mission, provided a purpose. If you look down at the heading above verse 30, we're going to be here in a few weeks. I can't wait to consider the purpose of this book But first, today I want us to consider our purpose. What are we for? What are we made for? I did not watch the Grammys last week. Apologies, Anthony. But I did read some of the headlines and some of the winners. And there's no way I wasn't going to look into this when I saw that the Grammy-winning song of the year was titled, What Was I Made For? Please, 22-year-old pop star Billie Eilish, tell me what 
I was made for. Now, I don't know anything about Billie Eilish. I could not name another song. I'm not recommending Billie Eilish. I'm probably sure I wouldn't recommend Billie Eilish. And I may be making the same mistake that I made a few weeks ago when I referenced Jimmy Eat World in a sermon because the only thing anyone remembered and asked about that sermon was about Jimmy Eat World. Oh, oh well. Again, I don't know anything about Billie Eilish, except that I'm pretty confident that Jimmy Eat World is far superior. But she did win a Grammy, and it is a hooky song title, and I definitely want to know what I was made for. So I, put up, I pulled up the lyrics this week, and nothing. <laughs> no answer. Billie Eilish has no idea what she or I was made for. Because I, because I, I don't know how to feel, but I want to try. I don't know how to feel, but someday I might. Someday I might. That's it. That, that's the whole song, basically. It, the whole thing is hauntingly hopeless. Uh, we have many women in our church who have better voices than her, apparently. Um, and, and, and the whole song conveys this, this sense of hopelessness. The whole song feels hopeless. And everybody loves it. Because our world doesn't have any answers to this most important of questions. And so it increasingly revels even in the fact that it doesn't have any answers. But the hopelessness and the despair will eventually win out, no matter how beautifully it's conveyed and celebrated. And the fact that this song and a 22-year-old's attempt to answer this question is the song of the year, is just a further disturbing uh, proof of where we are culturally. But listen, you have to have an answer to that question. You have to have an answer to the question, what was I made for? That peace and gladness that we're all looking for is dependent on the true answer to the question, what was I made for? And so what is the answer? Eilish has no idea, but John does. And he tells you in this text, Jesus, your maker, tells you what you were made for in this text. We're going to walk through three points. Uh, yes, this is probably the first time a sermon outline has ever been built around a Billie Eilish song. Um, but point number one, we're going to see that you were made for church mission. Point number two, we're going to see that you were made for church membership. And then we're going to close and see that you were made for and by the Holy Spirit. What were you made for? Let's, let's get to work and let's see. John chapter 20, I will read verses 19 through 23 just to get the whole scene in our heads, but our focus will be verses 21 through 23. Pay attention. This is what God wants to say to you today. This is what you were made for. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Let's ask for God's help in this time. Father, we are um, surrounded by a culture and a world that has no idea what it was made for, as it does not know its maker. Father, you have given us your word, this uh, special revelation from you to reveal yourself to us and to reveal ourselves to us, um, who we were made by and what we were made for. Father, as we are seeing in the book of Proverbs, you have wired your world to work in a certain way. And wisdom is, is living in harmony with, with your design um, for this world. And Father, that means that we have to know what we are made for and, and what we are here for. And so much of our misery comes from living um, out of line with our design. But it's so hard not to listen to the constant assault on our ears and on our eyes from a culture that does not know you and, and that hates you and tells you that we are for something completely contrary to what you tell us we are for. Um, Father, help us to see the goodness and the beauty, not just of your person, but also of your plan 
and of what you are doing for us, what you have done for us in Christ. Father, convince us and compel us that uh, you know better than we do and that there is peace and joy and gladness to be found only in you and in knowing you and in following your son, Jesus Christ. Father, use your word this morning to uh, do your work and to accomplish your will. Encourage and edify your saints. Uh, Father, challenge us, correct us if we need it. And Father, use your word to save sinners. Father, show us our sin. Um, show us the misery of sin and the hopelessness of this world apart from you. Um, Father, show us uh, what we are made for in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, you were made for church mission. Now, yes, just bear with me for a minute. I said we're talking about peace and gladness, and words like mission and membership, sadly, are probably not first what come to mind when we think peace and gladness, but maybe that's part of our very problem. So let's see if I can make my case. Uh, we are picking up in the middle of a scene. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen again, and that was the mission of the Christ. Look at verse 21. Jesus has come to the disciples. He is among them. He has said to them again, repetition, peace, be with you. I mean, how can he say that? Remember that biblically, peace is far greater than we tend to think that it is today. We think of peace primarily as the absence of something, as the absence of conflict. Biblically, peace is primarily the presence of something, the presence of wholeness, of completeness, of communion with the living God. But how can Christ pronounce peace on these men? In verse 19, we see that they are fearful and afraid. They are fearful and afraid in part because they are unbelieving. They do not yet understand and believe that the Christ has risen from the dead. They are fearful and afraid in part because they know they have denied and abandoned their Lord. This Lord that they are now hearing is risen from the dead. They are fearful and afraid because they are sinners. You see in our last verse that sin is a key part of our passage. I wanted to go with an outline, something like uh, sin or spirit or sin. That's not a bad summary of our text. But sin is, by definition, conflict with God, our maker, the one who made us and the one who made us for him. Sin separates. It is absence from the God who is life and joy and peace. Romans 5.10, because we were sinners, we were enemies of God. That's, that's conflict. So these men, the disciples, were sinners, and yet Christ pronounces peace twice. How? Back to verse 21. As the Father has sent me. Stop. That's how he can pronounce peace. The mission of Christ is how he can pronounce peace on these wretched sinners. What Christ has done and accomplished is how there can be a pronouncement of peace both for sinners like them and like us. And so before we could see and appreciate that we are sent, we have to first see and appreciate that he was sent as the Father has sent me. This is a key theme in John's gospel. We're getting close to his wonderful purpose statement. Well, here's Christ's wonderful purpose statement. He was sent, and he emphasizes this again and again and again. Throughout the book, Jesus has been identifying himself as the sent one. John 3, 16. You think you know it? Go back and listen to the sermon on it. For God so loved the world, not just the Jews, but his people called out from the whole of the world. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only Son, that those who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. There it is. The son is sent for salvation. John 5, 36, for the works that the father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the father has sent me. 728, he who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he has sent me. 1320, whoever receives me receives the one who sent me, and I could keep going on and on and on throughout the book. Identity is important. Indisputable identity is increasingly important. Sorry. 
but how we think of ourselves, the, the terms and the concepts with which we most consistently identify ourselves is really important. And it goes a long way in our experience of peace and gladness. How do you tend to identify yourself? How do you tend to, to think of yourself? I am a husband. I am a father only of daughters. I am a pastor. I am a reader. I am a former runner. I am a tar heel. I am a recovering grump and grinch. I am a forgiven, redeemed, reconciled, adopted child of God. I am in Christ. Those are all identity markers. Those are the good ones. Those are the ones that I'm happy to name publicly. There are others that are not so good. Some that I am tempted to identify myself with. Some that I am more hesitant to name. An anxious doubter. A fearful that I am a failed imposter. A prideful misanthrope. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't. How do you tend to conceive of yourself? We've been talking a lot about the importance of, of story. What, what story are you telling yourself about yourself? How do you tend to identify yourself in yourself story? The point here is that even when I am successfully resting in my God-given identity, the good and gracious things all rooted in my, my union with Christ, I still rarely ever identify myself as sent. But Christ is identified throughout this book as sent. And if he is so frequently conceiving of himself and talking of himself as sent, how much more then should we consider conceiving of ourselves and talking of ourselves more intentionally as sent? Do we in any way identify ourselves as sent? You cannot divorce the person from the work. Yet we have very much divorced ourselves, our person, from our purpose, our, our work. The mission of the church is supposed to be fundamental to who we are. It is what we are made for. And yet we have largely forgotten what we are and what we are made for. And so back to verse 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And so you are, are sent. Something we need to add to our understanding of ourselves and our identification of ourselves. We are sent ones. But it's even bigger and better than that. And we've got to get this right because many people are really confused about this these days. What are we sent for? What is the church for? What is the mission of the church? Well, Jesus very helpfully tells us very clearly in our text. But before we can really answer that, we got to keep moving through our text. But for now, just stick it in your head, and let's start with the fact that you were made for church mission. Let's continue to clarify what that mission actually is and how peace and gladness are found there, and let's continue to do that by moving first to point two. We'll come back to this. But first, point number two, let's see that you were made for church membership. I like this one. I'm being intentionally provocative with this one. Where in the world is this one coming from? Let's go a bit out of order. Verse 22 is all about the Holy Spirit. And he's the foundation and the fuel for all of this. So I want to save him for the end. Let's jump to verse 23. Look at it. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Man, man, what in the world can that mean? That is a hard verse. So let's work hard to try and get it right. But before we can sort out what it means that you or, or we forgive the sins of any, I want you to first see the connection to what has come before. Pay attention to the, to the flow of Christ's thought. He's present with his disciples. It's his initiative. It's entirely grace. He pronounces peace twice. They're glad when they see the Lord. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And then they are commissioned. They are sent. So his presence comes with peace, with gladness, and with purpose. It's sent. It's what they are sent for that we are seeking to clarify. And it's sent, notice this, it's sent as he was sent. 
Remember, sometimes the smallest words are the biggest words. And we've already seen what he was sent for in 317. He was sent for salvation. And here, notice what he says in verse 23. Ascending, and then there's the Spirit. And notice that we see him here identify the forgiveness of sins as the essential provision of that salvation that he was sent for. Calvin, on this verse, calls forgiveness the sum of the gospel. There are growing large sections of the Western church that seem to be missing the sum of the gospel. We cannot allow ourselves to miss the sum of the gospel. For as this was Christ's mission, it is therefore our mission and the mission of the church. We are sent as he was sent. We are sent for the forgiveness of sins. Of course, not in exactly the same way as he was. He is the actor in the mission of the forgiveness of sins. We are the announcers in this mission of the forgiveness of sins. Or we are the ambassadors, as Paul puts it. Flip to 2 Corinthians 5 for a moment, if you would like. You don't have to, but I'm going to read from it for a second. Page 966, if you have the Pew Bible. 2 Corinthians 5 is wonderful. Spend some time in it this week. 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to pick up in verse 19. What was God doing and then what is our role and what do we do in light of what God was doing? 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Paul writes this. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. That's amazing. We, we all hate evangelism. Let's just be honest. We hate it. We don't want to do it. This is amazing. This is a purpose that should excite us if we can get over ourselves. This is a mission worthy of an identity. God himself makes his appeal through us, his ambassadors. And what is his appeal? Rest of verse 20. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the mission of the church. Why would anyone, why would you need to be reconciled to God? Well, only if you were separated from God. And we've already seen that that's what sin is. It is conflict with God himself, separation from God. And all have sinned, and the wages of sin is death, as the God that it separates us from is life. And so our purpose, our mission then, is one of life. Listen, there is no other mission. There is no other purpose bigger and better than this. Nothing compares to this. Nothing should get our attention and our passion and our energy more than this. Let the world try and deal with people's earthly problems. We are trying to deal with people's eternal problems. We are trying to deal with the only thing that ultimately matters, the sin that separates. You can feed people, you can educate people, you can equip people, and let's be clear, all of those are good things. All of those are things that we too can be concerned with and that we too can play a role in and help out in. But if we focus on these things to neglect of the thing, then we have missed the main thing that Christ was about, his mission and the mission that he has entrusted to us, the forgiveness of sins. And people get all worked up about this and upset, like a church too heavenly minded. You can be more focused on now and people's problems. Fine. There's probably some truth to that. But not to the neglect of this. Like we know the basic saying, right? Like you feed a man, or you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Uh, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. And we all understand like, hey, it's better to help somebody eat for a whole life than a day. Right? It's just, like, that makes sense. We're talking about eternity. It's good to feed a man for a day. It's good to feed a man for life. What about eternity? That's what we're talking about here. Christ, the Son, was sent to save. Salvation fundamentally means being in right relationship with the God of life. 
And that's because sin fundamentally means being separated from the God of life, not in relationship with the God of life or in a relationship of enmity with the God of life. Listen, that's why everyone is so miserable. Sin is misery. All have sinned. All are miserable. Listen, you're going to watch the Super Bowl tonight probably, and you're going to be tempted to be like, look at all the beautiful people, and they're all so happy, and this looks so impressive, and there's all this money, and there's, of course, Taylor Swift's going to be there, and nobody cares. <laughs> well, you're going to be tempted to say, like, this is it. They've all got it. Listen, if they are, they're all miserable. If you look closer, if you look at their hearts, if they do not know the Lord, they are miserable. They're miserable. And that's just biblical. There's no way around that. And there are all kinds of attempts out there to mask the misery and to medicate the misery and to just plain pretend like it's not there, but it is. And it will not go away. And it will always ultimately result in eternal death unless unless something is done about the sin. And something has been done about the sin. Look at verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5, one of the best verses in the Bible. For our sake, God is doing stuff for our sake. That should thrill your soul. For our sake, he made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Substitution is what has been done about sin. Christ's mission was one of substitution. He came to take our place. And in taking our place, he took our sin. And in taking our sin, he took our death. And in taking our death, as the God of life, he rose again, defeating death itself. And so it is only in him that we find the forgiveness of sins. And that's what this whole book has been about. That's why it opened with John the witness proclaiming about this Christ in 129, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the mission of the Christ. Nothing else. That's the mission of the Christ. He is saving his people. That's the gospel that is the good news. Christ has died in our place for the forgiveness of sins. This is what he was sent to do. And this is what we are sent to to declare. Now, hold on, where are we? The second point is supposedly you are made for church membership. What does all that I just said about the forgiveness of sins have to do with that? Everything. Look at verse 23 again. All right, we had to first see that Christ's mission is fundamentally about the forgiveness of sins. So that's what we must fundamentally be about as well. But we still haven't answered the difficult question of the verse. What does it mean that Christ says to the disciples and to us, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them? Though much ink, and you could even argue blood uh, as well, has been spilled over this verse, I don't think that it's all that complicated. For our friends in the Roman Catholic Church, this would be the verse they use to defend their sacrament of penance and reconciliation. Or think confession. Right? You confess your sins to the priest. And he has the power and the authority from God based upon this verse to absolve you of those sins. To forgive you of those sins. Is that what Jesus means here? If so, you better be very careful not to offend me. Watch out. I just may decide to withhold forgiveness from you. Yeah, of course that's not what Christ means here. And we don't have time to pick that apart in, in detail But we agree with Mark 2, verse 7. Who can forgive sins but God alone? No man can forgive any other man's sins. Do not look to me for help in any way in the actual forgiveness of your sins. Peter, who is here, who is listening to Jesus in our text, in Acts chapter 2, just 40 days later, receives the Holy Spirit, preaches his first sermon, and concludes in verse 38 saying, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. In Acts 10, verse 42, Peter says that Christ commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be a judge of the living and the dead. To him, Christ, all the prophets bear witness that everyone 
who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You read the whole New Testament and you'll never once see any apostle forgive someone's sins. But we do see them constantly announcing the terms of forgiveness, uh, proclaiming how sinners can be forgiven and how sinners can know they have been forgiven. And that is through the preaching of the gospel that is all about the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. So it is only Christ who has an actual dynamic authority to accomplish the forgiveness of sins, but he does here give to his disciples and thus to his church an actual declarative authority to announce the forgiveness of sins and to announce and affirm as well as we can based upon God's word and the authority inherent in it who actually is forgiven and who is not. This is actually a very real authority though it's not actually the forgiving of sins because only God can do that. And this is why this is a church membership verse. This is where church membership comes into play. Only God can forgive sins. But God has entrusted his church with an actual and important authority to determine and declare imperfectly, as best as it can though, based upon his word, who is forgiven. And that's what church membership is all about. And this is why you were made for church membership. This is why I'm going to work hard to see how many people I can offend in the next couple of members, uh, minutes as we talk about church membership. I'm frequently asked, where is church membership in the Bible? Well, it's right here. And it's everywhere. The New Testament and its understanding of the church makes no sense apart from church membership. As I am going to be somewhat short on time here, let me commend to you two excellent sermons on church membership. Only one of them is by me. Um, but, but, but Jim, Peter's, though, was actually excellent. So please, go back and listen to it. Yeah, Peter preached on church membership in June of 22 from 1 Corinthians 12. Look it up. Two years before that, right before COVID collapse, I preached on church membership from John 13, 34. And so it seems that we do this every two years, but we need to do it more. Because church membership is so much more important than we think that it is. Flip in your Bibles quickly back to Matthew chapter 16. Page 822 in the Pew Bible. Matthew 16. Where's church membership in the Bible? Jesus in our text has said, if you forgive, if you withhold. That sounds familiar. That sounds like Matthew 16, verse 19. Peter, the apostle, has just confessed the Christ. This was revealed to him by God, by grace. Now, Peter gets who Jesus is. And so Christ declares Peter and his right confession of faith to be the rock on which the church will be built. The word church only shows up two times in the whole four Gospels. And it's here in this text and in the text text we're about to read. So these are very, very important. Ecclesia. Church is just an assembly, a gathering. It's, it's a people. God's people will be built and based upon Christ proclaimed by his apostles. And God's people will be known by their right confession of Christ. Verse 19, look at it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing, deo and luo in the Greek. I like that, deo and luo. It's the same thing as the forgiving and the withholding in our text. It could seem a little confusing. It's not. Consider keys. I don't have the keys to your home. Actually, I do have the keys to some of your home because <laughs> you have, for some reason, trusted me with your spare keys. But that's not the point. Keys are about authority. You possess the keys to your place. You have the authority to admit and bar, to allow to come in, and to determine who needs to stay out. Keys are the authority to determine and to declare access. And Christ says, here you go, Peter. Here you go, apostles. Here are the keys. Here is this authority. Here is this power. Now flip over to Matthew 18. Here is the 
second use of church in the whole of the Gospels. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20 are about discipline. If your brother sins against you, you go to him. How we don't do this? You go to him. You go to him lovingly. You go to him wisely. You go to him for his good. Listen, sin is never anyone's good. <laughs> never. It's just basic. So go. If he is unrepentant and refuses to listen, you lovingly and wisely go to him with others. If he is unrepentant and refuses to listen to them, you tell it to the church. The second use of that word. And if he refuses to repent and listen even to the church, the people of God, you are to put him out of the church. Now look at verse 18. It's the same thing. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So here are those keys given to the apostle, given to the church. Here is this authority that we're reading about in John 20, 23, and in Matthew 16, and in Matthew 18, entrusted to the church. That text about church discipline is clearly about the church's right and authority to put someone outside of the church. Someone whose life is in no way giving any, any evidence of grace. That's what repeated unrepentance demonstrates. We can't see someone's heart. All we can do is, is, is read their actions and read their lives and love them and pursue them. Uh, re repeated unrepentance uh, gives evidence, at least, at least points in the direction of there being no life and no grace. And so the church is called to put that person out of the church. Those are the keys. That's the authority given by Christ to his church. Now the question is, well, how does the church exercise that authority? What, what, how does this even work? We have understood until just America in the last like 150 years, we have understood how that works. And it is through the three marks of the church, as the reformers uh, have named it. It is through the right preaching of the word. It is through the right administration of the ordinances or the sacraments. We don't need to be scared of that word. And it is through the right exercise of church discipline. Those are the three marks of how you tell that you have a church, according to the reformers. The right preaching of the word right administration of the ordinances, right exercise of church discipline. You don't have those three things, you don't have a church. A lot of things calling themselves a church that aren't a church. But this is what it means that if we forgive the sin of any, going back to John 20, that the sins are forgiven them, and that if we withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. And that, this also important authority, this mission of the church, it's impossible without church membership. Again, I can't make a long biblical case for where it is in Scripture. But we start reading in Acts, and we see throughout it that we see the church is counting. They're adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. That's membership. They know who is in, and they know who is out. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul commands the church to put a sexually immoral man out of the church. To put someone out, you have to know somehow who is in. That's church membership. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about this punishment by the majority. To have a majority, you have to have a whole, a, a number. That's church membership. Peter, in his sermon, explained how 1 Corinthians 12 and the metaphor of the church as the one body with many members, it makes no sense without church membership. And listen, the whole Christian faith makes no sense without church membership. Because Christian faith is a church centered faith because God is a church centered God everything God does we're going to see this in Ephesians 1 everything he does is ultimately about his glory revealed in and through his church his people the people whom he loves I made my case for church membership from John 13 34 I thought it was a unique contribution to the church membership conversation, but no one has come knocking on my door to write a book about it. Oh well. But I built an argument off of Christ's command. Just like the mission, back in John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Let's clarify what that means. Let's be clear. Love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And my outline was my argument. One, Christ commands love. 
Two, Christ commands love as he loves. Three, Christ loves through covenant. What is covenant? Four, Christ commits through covenant. And so five, Christians commit through covenant. The covenant of church membership. Remember, presence, that's what this whole thing is about. God with us. And that's what covenant is all about. Covenant is how God is with us, and covenant is committed communion. And this is what you were made for. And listen, this is what our world hates. This is where our world loves social media. Because it, it hates true communion, so it holds out this thing that is false communion. And it hates commitment, so it gives you this virtual thing that involves no commitment whatsoever. But commitment is key to love. Had I gone to my Melissa 12 years, whoa, 14 years ago. How long have we been married? We're getting old. Had I gone to her 14 years ago and said, hey, I really, really, really do love you. I love you. And I'm going to give you six out of seven nights a week. But one of the nights I'm going to reserve for these other women. Okay? So six out of seven is really good. I'm committed to you. Six out of seven nights, but this one other night. I'm going to keep that open for other women. She would have punched me in the face. <laughs> and she would have never married me. Because that's not love. Because love is commitment. And it is communion. And our world hates it. And our world doesn't know how to pursue it. But it's what we were made for. You were made for communion with the triune God of life. And this is why nothing else can or will satisfy you. This is why you're trying to live as if you were made for anything else. will let you down and make you miserable. Because this is what you are for. And this is good. It is eternally good. And there is great peace and gladness to be found here. In the fact that the God of the universe, the God that you offended in your sin, the fact that he still comes after you in Christ, that he still forgives you, still reconciles you, still graciously brings you into committed communion with him. That's covenant. That's how Christ has loved us. And if we are to love as he has loved us, then that is going to involve committed communion with him and with his people. And that is impossible without church membership. That's how I can say that you were made for church membership. Because you were made for God. You were made to love and be loved by God. And you can only do that in covenant. And Christ is clear. You were made for God's people. You were made to love and be loved by God's people. And you can only do that truly in the covenant of church membership. I am very concerned that we are not very concerned about this. There are many of you in here that are not members of a local church. And listen, that, that, that should concern you. I will be clear because someone will complain. Church membership is not required for salvation. We are not saved by church membership. Only the grace of God in Christ received through faith is required for salvation. But, come on, to claim that you have received that Christ and to refuse to bind yourself to and commit yourself to God's people as an expression, as evidence of his binding himself to you and committing himself to you, listen, that should at least concern you. First, John is clear. Our relationship with God is revealed in large part through our relationship with God's people. Are you part of God's people? How do you know? Christ has told us. And he has given the church the responsibility and the authority of making that known. It is through the preaching of the word. It is through the right response of repentance and faith to that word. Have you done that? Remember a few weeks ago, discipleship is difficult to discern. The church is meant to help you with that. It is through the administration of the ordinances that can help you with that. Baptism is the ordinance of entrance. The Lord's Supper is the ordinances, ordinance of communion and continuation. And listen, the two go together, and they go in order. They are how the church exercises the keys. And they are how the church determines and declares who is in. And all of these things are meant to be connected to church 
membership. And yet in the Baptist world, there's just like this Lord's Supper free for all. And it weighs on my soul. Because Paul says that some of you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourselves. Some of you are coming to the table when you should not be coming to the table. And it doesn't seem to matter what I say. Take this seriously. The ordinances and our commitment to God's people are all meant to go together. The New Testament has no concept of a Christian not connected to a local church. And a Christian connects to a local church through the covenant of church membership. Listen, it doesn't have to be here. You're probably, probably not going to be here now after the sermon. I hate that guy. Um, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have to be here. No church is perfect. We are not for everyone. I, and I get that. But it does have to be somewhere. Every Christian is called to commit themselves to a faithful body of believers that is founded upon the word of God. And listen, plug here. We get to witness this next week. Lord willing, as we are going to baptize Judy Chin. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Wait for it. We're going to baptize her in an inflatable hot tub. Come on. How neat is that? All that aside, the neat actual thing is that we get to celebrate the ordinance, the sacrament of baptism with Judy, symbolizing publicly her entrance into the people of God. And then right after that, because these things go together, we get to, Lord willing, admit her into church membership as part of the covenant family of Woodside. And that is going to be us as a church saying, hey, Judy, you are ours, and we are yours. And we are committed to you, and you are committed to us. And we are to care for one another and bear one another's burdens. And we are uniquely committed to one another as church memberships in a way that we are not uh, committed to others who are not covenant members of this local church. So come next Sunday, and it is going to be a lot of fun. For this is what we were made for. We were made for union and communion with the God of life, experienced in and with union and communion with the people of God. You will only be satisfied by something bigger than you and something outside of you. You were designed to be outward oriented. Remember, sin is the inward turn. Grace and salvation begins to turn us outward. And as we begin to focus on this great and gracious God, we begin to experience peace and gladness in him. As we begin to focus on the people of this great and gracious God, we begin to experience peace and gladness in them. You were made for membership. You were made for mission. Now let me just briefly give you the third point. I sent VJ my outline before I finished my sermon. Let me at least touch on verse 22, and I will not be long, I promise. That felt like a conclusion, but I teased you. It wasn't, right? That's bad preaching. But let me run through this real quick. Look at verse 22, and then I'll actually be done. Because this is the foundation and the fuel for everything that we've just discussed. All of this is dependent on the Spirit. You are made for and by the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. I have no time to defend this, um, but I think that this is a symbolic thing. I don't think that Jesus is actually giving them the Holy Spirit here because that's clearly in Acts 2, and I just can't come up with what exactly this is in light of Acts 2. Um, and he has told us already that the coming of the Holy Spirit awaits his physical absence after uh, the ascension. So I think this is just pointing forward and preparing them for that. In the Greek, there is no first on them. You see where it says he breathed on them. The on them isn't there. It literally just says he breathed and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say when they would receive him. Some have called this a sort of acted parable. Plus, as we'll see next week, Thomas isn't there. Right? Did the ten receive the Holy Spirit? And poor Thomas is like, sorry, Thomas, you're out. Like, you, don't, you don't get the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that seems unlikely. Whatever is going on exactly, it's clear that the great gift that Christ gives to his church is the Holy Spirit. And you remember how much John loves Genesis. This is part of that. We've already seen the first day of the week in verse 19. That's a reference to creation, to life. What else was going on? Uh, that beginning of Genesis, Genesis 1-2, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit is closely connected to creation and life. In Genesis 2-7, God breathes 
life into the man, and he becomes a living spirit. In John 3, Jesus said we must be born again of the spirit. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Wind, spirit, breath are all the same word in the Greek. The point is it's the spirit who gives life. It's the spirit who takes what the son has accomplished and applies it to us. This is the sense in which we were made by him. John is working really hard to help us to see that all of this is about a new creation. And as the Spirit is God himself, the third person of the Trinity, we were very much made for the Spirit, to have communion with him. He's no less God than the Father and the Son. But each person of the Trinity has a distinct role to play in redemption. And we've seen the Spirit's role. This was one of the main things that Christ wanted to teach us on his final night. What is the Spirit all about? 1614, he will glorify me. How can we know where the Spirit's at work? Where you see the Son most glorified. 1526, he will bear witness about me. You see why our text goes from presence to peace and gladness to scent to spirit? It's the Spirit who bears witness about the Christ. 1527, and you also will bear witness. This is the mission of the church that you were made for. To bear witness about the Christ who is life. The Christ who gave his life that you might gain yours. And the Spirit is both the person and the power that equips us to carry out our mission and to fulfill our purpose. And there is great joy to be found here. And that's what you were made for. You were made for joy. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever because he is eminently enjoyable, infinitely more enjoyable than anything this world can offer you. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And you were meant to find your eternal joy in glorifying him, in knowing and being known by him. Nothing else will cut it. You can try as hard as you want for the whole of your life, but any and all attempts to find happiness outside of the Lord will fail. And all attempts to find your purpose and what you are made for within yourself will fail you. There are ultimately only two stories. Both are love stories. A love of self or love from God. Love of God. Do we know, do we believe that the love of and from God is infinitely better than we or the world can offer? It's what you were made for. Uh, Opened with Billie Eilish. I'll close with Billie Eilish. She concludes her song of the year singing, I don't know how to feel, but someday I might. Someday I might. Think I forgot how to be happy. Something that I'm not, but something I can be. Something I wait for. Something I'm made for. Something I'm made for. She gets that she was made to be happy. She just doesn't get in any way how to be happy. And in the song, she connects it with, with finding herself. She connects it with, with, with feeling. And once she knows how to feel, once she knows how to be herself, then she'll be happy. And I would argue that's one of the great lies of our culture. Feeling is great. We were made to feel. We were made to be glad. But we were made. She's saying made. That implies a maker. We were made. And he's the one who tells us how it all works. And he is how it all works. Billie Eilish and every other celebrity and every other person in this world is ultimately sad and will ultimately stay that way forever. God, come and become man to live and die and rise again. God, come and become man to live and die and rise again for the forgiveness of sins so that you can have peace and gladness with God. How can we not tell that good news to somebody? You are sent. That's what you're sent for. That's what you're made for. And the more we can understand and appreciate what we were saved from, the more we will willingly and gladly do and tell others what we were made for. That's what the church is for. So unite yourself together with God's people and get to work together with God's people. You will find gladness and peace only to the degree that you live in accordance with what you were made for.
2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. I can't actually give Billie Eilish the last word. Here's Paul. Here's the last word. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Does it? For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's what you were made for. He is what you were made for. Not to live for yourself, but to live for him who gave everything so that you could live. He is life, and he is present, and he is peace, and he is gladness. Live for him, live on mission with his people, empowered by his spirit. That's what you are made for. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, your word is life. Your word reveals to us and relates to us the Christ who is life. Father, forgive us for how often we have this week looked for our life elsewhere. How we've looked to it in ourselves. How we have forgotten what we are made for. Or how we have pretended uh, like we get to determine uh, what we were made for. Father, you have told us very clearly who you are and who we are. And you have told us very lovingly where we will find peace and gladness and life. And that is found only in the Christ who solved our sin problem. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that you worked on our behalf. You worked for our sake in your son, Jesus Christ. Forgive us for how apathetic and cold we are sometimes to that which is of first importance. I pray that you would give us great contentment and great joy in the Lord and that we would increasingly identify ourselves as his and as sent by him for the good of others. Um, Father, I pray for Woodside Community Church. I pray that you would make us a place who loves the gospel. Father, a place who loves church membership because it's about covenant and it's about communion. It's about be, being committed to one another uh, for one another's good. Father, help us to love uh, one another better. Help us to care for one another to your glory and as a witness to the watching world. And we pray that you would use us to proclaim the message of the forgiveness of sins and to bring sinners um, from death to life entirely by your grace. Father, please help us, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time. This whole service is meant to be one of worship. We worship with the whole of our lives. Um, one of the ways that we worship is uh, through the giving of what God has first given to us, visitors. Uh, you are not, we're not compelling you to give. You are welcome to, uh, of course, but this is how we support the mission of the church. Um, if, you have, if you are visiting and you filled out one of those visitor cards, please put it in the plate, and we'd love to get to know you and talk with you and, and see um, how we can help you. Um, Sam, uh, why don't you pray for the offer? Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come together ordering our lives so that we can be here today together to hear the word and uh, to be united uh, together here. Uh, pray for this offering, Lord, that you would uh, bless the giver and that you would uh, just multiply this offering for your kingdom, that we would uh, just be able to praise you for how you are able to use this church and its resources for your kingdom. Thank you for all your grace and mercy upon us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
quick announcements before we close with our final song. We will pray together for a few minutes after the service at 1 o'clock. Uh, I invite you to join Pastor Mike and I up there. Uh, Bible study Thursday night, 7.30. I'm excited I get to be back uh, in um, Ephesians uh, verse 7. It just goes so perfectly with our text. Uh, in him we have... In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And that's what we get to consider on Thursday night from Ephesians 1. So I'm very excited about that. Um, please join us. Um, the ladies are starting a new Sunday school class next week at 10 o'clock. So ladies, this would be a perfect time to join if you have not been uh, going uh, through that with them. Uh, they're going to be doing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's very, very exciting. I see Nicole, see Judy, ladies, if you are interested or have any questions about that. And we'll continue on in Proverbs downstairs as well. And members, please do remember we are actually having a business meeting next week uh, on the 18th. No matter what, there will be a business meeting. So please be there. Um, but we're also going to celebrate and have a party, and we're going to baptize and clap and rejoice and eat good food and be together um, because that's what church membership is about. So members, we do encourage you to come uh, be there at 1 o'clock uh, next week um, for the members' meeting. I look forward to it. Um, let's stand. Let's sing together as we close. <clears throat> Oh, yeah.
church, it is so good uh, to sing with you. Um, I am not exaggerating in any way when I say this. I am prone to exaggeration. This is not an exaggeration. We travel a lot. We go to other churches. We were gone last Sunday. I have never once sat in another church with the music and be like, oh, their music is better than ours. Not one single time. I'm always glad to be back and home with this music team, uh, singing with you all as well. Um, so you are blessed, uh, church. Um, it's good to sing together. And we just sang it, by faith you are called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost. Um, church, uh, you are sent. Um, our God is good. Um, it is a privilege to be with you. Uh, um, come find Pastor Mike or I if we can help you with anything. Um, we love you. Let me close you in a word of prayer or benediction and benediction. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your grace. Father, thank you for the gift of faith. Father, we couldn't even do that part ourselves. Um, and yet you are so gracious and you are so good that you have done everything that was required um, to move us from death to life. Father, there is no greater change than the change from death to life. And you, you have made that possible in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the life um, that we have in him entirely by your grace. I pray that that grace would make us very glad and very thankful um, for all that you have done for us, regardless of what we may be facing in the week to come. Um, Father, give us great joy in the Lord. Father, I pray that you would compel us. I pray that the love of Christ would control us and that we would increasingly see ourselves as sent, that we would increasingly see those around us uh, apart from you um, in their sin. And Father, and that we would understand and believe that what they need, the one thing that they need, is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Um, so I pray that we would be a people uh, who are more and more prone um, to speak the good news um, to those who are around us. We thank you that you are patient with us. We thank you that you are kind to us. Um, Father, we thank you for this church and the gift that it is to be together. Um, we love you. We ask that you would help us to love you more this week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.